favorite scriptures when I think about the Holy Spirit actually comes from John chapter 16. And I was reading it again this morning. And Jesus is about to ascend back into heaven. And he's telling the disciples, I'm leaving. And they're, they're disappointed that Jesus, the very living, breathing image of God that they've walked beside for the last three years, watching him touch and heal people right in front of them. He's leaving. But he actually tells them in verse 7, it's better that I leave so that the advocate can come. Do you know who the advocate is? The advocate is the Holy Spirit, the presence of God. And Jesus is saying, you don't want me. No, 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 no. I got something better. It's the Holy Spirit, the advocate, who's going to be with you and walk with you. And the greatest things that you have seen me do here on the earth, you're going to do even better things because of the power of the Spirit. That is the Spirit we have access to right now. Right now at this moment, he's here. He's speaking, he's moving, he's breathing. Zechariah chapter 4 says, Not by power, not by might, but by the Spirit of the living God. So what it takes this morning is an invitation. Saying, Holy Spirit, you're welcome here in this place. Let us become more aware of your presence. Open our eyes to see your Spirit moving, our ears to hear your Spirit speaking. So I want to encourage each of us today, would you make that a prayer just for a moment in the, the quietness of your heart and your own spirit today. Holy Spirit, make us more aware of your presence right here, right now.
and every one of you. And if I haven't had the chance to be you yet, my name is Kate, and I have the privilege of serving as a campus pastor here at this location.
so that you can advance your work in your kingdom here on earth. So I pray in Jesus' name that our gifts this morning would bring heaven down, that it would minister to people in our in our right here in our house, in our community, and across the world. God, we trust you. We're thankful for you. Would you do with a, what you would want to do with it, God, and bless it. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.
So I went home and told Jefferson about this camp in Northern California called Jerry Stranch and how he wrote things and we'll be together for the week, but man, there may not be a bathroom and the man can spam. And he's like, let's go! And I'm like, great, let's go. So we traveled all the way across the country, six, seven hours of flight to land in San Francisco to then drive for about six hours to Northern California into the middle of nowhere. And as I was pulling down the road and realized my cell phone service was not going to work for this week, I... I thought, why in the world am I here? What have I gotten myself into? There was plenty of camps between South Florida and somewhere closer to South Florida than where I am right now. But that ended up being one of the most remarkable weeks in my life with my son. In fact, I look back on that week all these years later, and it's still one of the best weeks I've ever had. Our relationship was good before that, but man, it just went to a new place. We saw God do some amazing things in our lives together, in his life, and we didn't have to eat spam. They had a chef <laughs> that had cooked uh, tenderloin and grilled salmon, and I was like, we stayed for a couple more weeks. I mean, this is good. And one night, we uh, put on our backpacks, and we left the cabin, and we, uh, we headed up into the, the, the mountains, and we slept on the sleeping bags out over the stars. And there wasn't any lights anywhere except from the heavens. And it was beautiful. I remember Jefferson and I had a hard time falling asleep that night. And I, I, uh, we were praying about some stuff. I, I got my phone and took a picture. And I keep this picture of Jefferson on my phone uh, from that night, 13 years ago. And it was because God began to work in his life that week. Like some prayers that we have been praying for about two years, we saw God that week on that little camp in the middle of nowhere. God began to, to move the dial a little bit there. And I keep that on my phone to remind me that sometimes God answers his prayers, not when and where we expect him to. And if we're not careful, we'll miss it. So I almost missed that whole experience because I was resistant to wanting to go to camp. Another camp. No, thank you. I, I, I didn't have a mindset for that kind of camp. I didn't even understand that kind of camp with filet and yawn. Sam actually existed. Like, I didn't know camp could be like that. See, I almost missed it because of my past experiences and my personal preferences. My past experience and my personal preferences almost kept me from what God had for me. And what I realized is that there are a lot of Christians that allow themselves to miss out on what God has for them because of their past experiences and their personal preferences. Things that God wants to do in our lives that we resist, either because of our past experience, we think this is the way church should be, or this is the way Christian life should be, or this is all we've experienced it, or personal preference. I don't know if I want any of that. That's a little bit, woo! Right, I've seen those speaking in tongues. <laughs> and we resist what God wants to do. What we're going to talk about today, apart from your personal relationship with Jesus, second only to your personal relationship with Jesus, is what I believe to be the single most critical component to you experiencing this abundant life that God has created you for. In fact, I would say without reservation or hesitation that without you getting a grip, grip on what we're going to talk about, you're going to miss out on what the abundant life is, is all about. And the key verse for today is actually like an exclamation mark on the end of this series. It's found in John chapter 6, verse 63, and it says this, it is the Spirit alone who gives life. Would you say that with me a lot wherever you are today? It is the Spirit alone that gives life. One more time. It is the Spirit alone that gives life, which means without the Holy Spirit, you will never have this life. You cannot have true life, what he's talking about here, apart from the working of the Holy Spirit. You have to, you have to know, personally know, the power and the person of the Holy Spirit. And I use those two words very intentionally. The power and the person of the Holy Spirit. Because there is a power that is afforded to you as a follower of Jesus that you don't have to rely on your own strength, your ability, your own knowledge. You have the power of God that raised Christ up from the dead that wants to live inside of you and control you. But you've got to give in, you've got to tap into that power. 
You're going to access the power of God that wants to have his way in you. But it's not just about the power. It's about the person of the Holy Spirit. And if you don't ever see him as a person, you will never have a personal relationship with him. As long as you think he's just like a, woo, a feeling. How do you have a relationship with people? You can't. Right? He's not like a force. He's a force. No, you can't have a relationship with a force. He is a person that you can have a relationship with. This whole series is all about you making the most out of your life. You've got to make the most of your relationship with the Holy Spirit. Now, the problem is a lot of Christians have a hard time understanding who the Holy Spirit is. Even if you grew up going to church, there's a good chance that your church didn't talk much about the Holy Spirit. They were afraid he might show up and mess some things up, right? So they didn't talk about it too much. They might have said, what did they do with prayer? They did it with Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, right? I mean, but what is, what, what, what is he? Who is he? I don't know. I mean, like, we need to get a reminder of Jesus. Middle... Eastern man, olive skin complexion, 30, 32, 33, shoulder-length hair, we've all seen the chosen, so we kind of understand what we look like. Or God the Father, like, okay, a, a benevolent, older father, maybe he's in his 60s, and Jesus is 30, so let's call it 60, he's got some gray hair. We got to give you a picture that if you go to the Holy Spirit, we're like, what? Like, what is, what, what is, what is that, right? And when I was growing up, they only used the King James Version, and it was called the Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost. And that scared me as a kid, okay? I'm just telling you. But can I tell you, the Holy Spirit is not someone to be frightened of. He's our comfort. He's our constant companion. He's our help. He's not someone to be ignorant of because the church we grew up in didn't talk much about it. He's not someone to be ignored or resisted because we're not too sure if that's what we want. He has everything that you need for life and apart from a deep, growing relationship with the Holy Spirit, you and I will end up without that life. So who is he? But first, we can understand that he's God. Holy Spirit is God. He is as much God as God the Father is God. And Jesus is God, God Father, God Son, God Holy Spirit. So it's not an it. He is God. He is fully God. He's not a feeling. He's not a force. He's not an emotion. He's not the vibes. He is God. He is fully God. He is the third person of the Trinity, and not third in rank, but third in revelation. Meaning that we understand who he is in full revelation as we get into Acts and beyond. We begin to see the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. But he's the first one mentioned in the Bible by name in Genesis chapter 1. He was there at the foundation and the creation of the world. At the foundation of the church in Acts chapter 2. He was there breathing new life into what was had never been before. And he's the one that breathes new life inside of us. He is God. He is not wind. He is not fire. He is not a dove. Although sometimes he is symbolized by those things, we don't reduce him down to those things. He is God. Fully God. I think about how many times you probably pray to God. And you might pray to Jesus. But how often do you pray to the Holy Spirit? I would suggest that perhaps maybe you should pray to him more than any of them. They are one. God, Father, God, Son, God, Holy Spirit. But I find myself a lot of times, I used to find myself praying to Jesus. Dear Jesus, dear Jesus. That's what I was taught. Dear Jesus, right? And you should still pray to Jesus. Don't, don't go out here and say, God said you should pray to Jesus. But I'm saying you should pray to the Holy Spirit. In fact, many nights when I go to sleep at night, you've heard me say this before, my body needs rest, my mind needs rest, my mind needs rest, but my spirit, which is made in the image of God, God's spirit neither slumbers nor sleeps. And you have made it the image of God. So I actually say, hey, Holy Spirit, would you just speak to my spirit while I'm sitting? Yes. Like, I'm just, I'm like, I'm just, my body's got to fall asleep. I'm praying my mind will shut off. But I'm praying my spirit will just stay except for your spirit. Right? And there's been times I've woken up at 2 in the morning, 3 in the morning, and my spirit is singing a worship song. I mean, the spirit is coming. I know it's just like I'm singing it because I'm going to wake up doing it. But my spirit is singing it. Right? He's God. The second thing is you need to know that he is the promise of God. Yep. Jesus promised. 
that the Holy Spirit would come for us. This is what he says in Luke chapter 24. And now I will send the Holy Spirit just as my Father promised. But stay here in the city in Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit comes and fills you with power from heaven. So he's promised. We're going to read a few more verses about that. Before Jesus ever promised him, 800 years earlier, God had promised that the Holy Spirit would come. As he spoke through the prophet Joel in Joel chapter 2, he said, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. And your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. Now, the reason this promise was so significant, especially being declared in the Old Testament, is because at that time, the Holy Spirit would only descend upon a person for a moment. And it was usually a prophet, a priest, a king, or perhaps a warrior. And it would help them accomplish a task. But then the Spirit didn't reside there, in them. And so what this promise says is there's coming a day when the Holy Spirit is going to be poured out, not just on priests and prophets, but on all people, sons and daughters. We're all going to have the Spirit of God available to live and rule and reign in our lives, which we know is now that time. Right? We, we have that now. That is powerful. And Jesus said, actually in John chapter 16, um, he's, he's getting ready to be betrayed, and now he's going to be betrayed. And he actually tells them about this coming promise of God. He says, it is actually better for you than I'm gone. Look what he says in John 16. It is best for you that I go away, because if I don't go away, the Holy Spirit won't come. But if I do go, I'll send him to you. Now this had to be foreign to the, to the disciples that were hearing him say this. Like, where are you going? Why are you leaving us? And we didn't go. Is it good for you to go? Yeah, it's good for me to go so that he can come. I mean, think about it. When Jesus was on the earth, he was fully God and fully man, right? Fully God, all power, but fully man, fully human, meaning that he was limited by his human body. So he could only be in one place at one time, with one group of people or one person at a time. So if you were here today and you wanted to have an audience with Jesus, you'd have to buy a ticket, fly to Israel, in the middle of what else they're going through, try to find Jesus. Is he in the Galilee? Is he down in Bethany? I don't know. You find him, and then you get to have a few minutes with him at best, and then you've got to get back on the plane and come home. And so what he's saying is that God in you is better than God with you. He was Emmanuel, God with us. But he's actually saying it's better that I go away so that the Holy Spirit can come and take up residence on the inside of you because God in you is better than God, God with you. And when you have the Holy Spirit living inside of you, you have everything that you need. It is, it is accessible to you all the time. No matter where you go, the Holy Spirit will go with you. Once he's in your life, and you give him control of your life, you start going this way, he's with you. You go this way, he's right there. No matter what you face in life, mountains high, valleys low, he's got you. Remember we started off the series talking about the guy named Ali Afa that heard that other people were finding all these diamonds and great wealth all around the world. And so what did he do? He sold his farm, left his family, went searching around the world for diamonds and all this wealth to not find anything to end up dying penniless and alone. While the man who had bought Ali Afa's farm actually discovered that big black rock on the farm one day and that was a diamond in the rough and he realized there were diamonds all over Ali Afa's farm. It was not his farm. It became one of the most famous diamond mines in the entire world. And he said, what if the life you're looking for is closer than you even imagined? What if everything that you're searching for, that God got it closer than you could ever imagine? The Spirit of God inside of you has everything that you need to experience the life you've been created to live. So how does the Holy Spirit work in our lives? Well, there are many things that we learn from the Bible of how the Holy Spirit works and wants to work in our life. Um, one of the ways that he likes to work is he'll light you up. He'll shine things on your life and in your life and help you see what you cannot see any other way. In fact, there's a verse of scripture in, second, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 that says someone living on an entirely human level, so living just carnally, 
just on their own, rejects the revelations of God's Spirit. For they make no sense to him. He cannot understand the revelations of the Spirit because they are only discovered by, say that last part with me, the illumination of the Spirit. They don't know what they don't know. So a person living apart from the Holy Spirit, apart from God, cannot see what the Holy Spirit is wanting to, to show them, which means apart from the Spirit, there are some things we will never see. We will, our eyes will never be open to understand some of the revelations of God apart from the working of the Holy Spirit. That's the only way that we see it. In fact, the only way a person can find their way to God, the only way that you ever found your way to God, is the Holy Spirit turned the light on and begin to show you your way to God. He began to light up the pathway to help you see which way you needed to go. He, he began to help you see what was missing in your life. And there was only going to be found in God. And then once you come to God, the Holy Spirit will illuminate things to show you that you can't see any other way. Have you ever been reading the scripture? Maybe a verse you read before, and all of a sudden, it just like, jumps off the page like, oh my goodness. I thought it was in there. Yeah, it has been, but the Holy Spirit is illuminating it and giving you wisdom and insight to it. Yeah. Or you come to church on a Sunday, and I'm preaching, and all of a sudden it's like the Holy Spirit's going, I got you, I see you, right there, right? And have you ever had that happen? We're like, how does Todd know that? <laughs> Todd doesn't know that. God knows that, right? And God is the one that is going to point that out to you and show you what you need. You know, or perhaps sometimes you're in prayer. This is what happens to me. I'll be in prayer, praying about something, and the Holy Spirit will go, uh, Todd, let's talk about that right here. Your attitude this week. That thing you said, you should have said, that thing you did, let's just talk about, let's talk about this area of your life that needs to be more fully surrendered to me. And he'll illuminate things. When he does that, our natural tendency is to get uncomfortable. And go, ah, oh, yeah, let's, uh, let's do something else. Let's turn that off. Or we're like, well, Lord, I'm not the only one dealing with that. What about them? Right? Especially him over there, right? I mean, that's, right? Listen, when the Holy Spirit shines his light on you, let it do its work. Yeah. It's for your good. Yeah. It's to help you find life. Okay, another way the Holy Spirit sometimes works in our life is uh is like his map. Which by the way, everybody who is uh, 35 years or uh, younger, this is a map. And before we have phones with maps and people to tell us where to go, we actually had to like open these things up. And can you imagine we're driving around? And we're like, How do we do that and not die? I don't know. Right? It's, just, it's amazing. Oh my gosh. Well, the Holy Spirit wants to be your map, which is your guide to help you know which way to go. In that verse in, in John uh, chapter 16, where Jesus is talking about the Holy Spirit that's coming, he said that when the, the Spirit of truth comes, he's the Spirit of truth, he will guide you into all truth, and he will tell you what is yet to come, which means he's going to reveal things to you that you can't find out any other way. Have you ever been lost in a city? You didn't know before you go? Have you been lost in a foreign country where you didn't know the language? I've done that a couple times. Drive Julie with me in America. One of the first times we were over in, uh, in Europe, we were backpacking. We heard us tell the story. And uh, we had no money. And, uh, and we were just backpacking for a couple weeks. And I thought it was a great idea. And I had a great time. But I, was, I had no money to like, get a guy. Like they had tours. You could buy a tour. We had no money to buy a tour. So I would just make stuff up. <laughs> I mean, not exactly. You know, like, that's the Coliseum. Okay, there's Rome. There's the Coliseum. Bad things happen there. Christians die, so we're not going in, right? And we just keep walking on it, looking for Paul, looking for this. I couldn't find much. It wasn't that great. It was okay. We were there. It's my 20, uh, 25th wedding anniversary. I took her back. So about 20 years later, we went back to her. And I didn't do it that way. I actually hired a guy to come to the hotel to pick us up. He was from Rome, so he knew all the places around Rome. He knew where Paul was in the Maritime prison and where he wrote some of the letters that are now epistles, so and we got to be there for that. He took us to the church where he's buried. I mean, it was like remarkable. We had the best pasta because this guy was from Rome. He knew what to do. It was so different because we had a guy. The Holy Spirit wants to be your guy. He wants to show you where to go. He doesn't want you wandering around lost and confused and trying to figure it out and trying to just 
mix stuff up and so you can figure out what's right. He wants to guide you where to go. And the reason this is important is because we live in a culture today that says you can go any way you want to go. You can do anything you want to do, right? Just be you, live your own truth. The problem with that is that that's not truth. In fact, there's a verse of scripture in Proverbs 14, 12 that says there is a way or a path that seems right to a person, but the end leads to death. God is always there. He's got other places he wants to take you. So the spirit of God inside of you will actually help you find it, speak to you. And when he speaks to you, can I tell you, the Holy Spirit will use the word to give you a word. When you're needing a word and you're needing direction, he's going to use the word to speak to you. So every time you open the word and study the word, you're actually giving the Holy Spirit something to work with. When I'm trying to make a decision, I'm praying, Holy Spirit, would you guide me in this decision? Many, many times you will bring scripture to mind that I've studied or read or seen about earlier that week to guide me. And why wouldn't he? Since he is the author of this word. He authored this word to speak to us. And so he will use his word to speak a word to us. And his word will never contradict the word because he cannot contradict himself. He'll guide you. He wants to guide you. The Holy Spirit is also like this compass. Have you ever seen somebody using a compass? It's like they're, uh, they're, 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 they're making little adjustments all along the way. It's different than a map. A map gets you from point A to point B. Tells you which path to take. But a compass is for the slight little subtle adjustments along the way. It is more about true north and aligning yourself to what is true north so that you can get where you need to go. And the reason those little adjustments are so important is because if you're just a degree or two off, a year or two later, you'll be way off. And you'll end up someplace you never wanted to go in your life or in your marriage or in your business or in your relationship or with your kids. And so the Holy Spirit is going to give you little, little course directions. This verse in John goes on to say, Unless I go away, the counselor will not come to you. But if I go, I'll send him to you. And when he comes, he'll convict the world of guilt in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment. Don't think about this as going to convict the world like all the bad people out there. What that means is it's going to convict all of us for sin, when there's sin in our life. For righteousness, it says. Righteousness means to stay in right relationship, how to, how to stay in right step with God. So he's going to speak to us about when we get out of step with God. When our lives get out of step with God, the Holy Spirit will say, hey, go look for a And to judgment, that means to decisions. That you have wisdom. He gives you wisdom in what we need to do. He wants to, he wants to give you this. So correction, conviction is, is good. Conviction from the Holy Spirit is not bad. We can think conviction is bad. Oh, I'm under conviction. And then we're under conviction. No, conviction is for your good. Right. It's to help you live life and not get caught off somewhere you don't want to be. Yeah. And sometimes the little nudges of the Holy Spirit are when He's telling you to do something that maybe you haven't thought of. Like you need to go pray for that person. You, you need to get that, that family some money right now. They need some money. Or you need to share that scripture with, you, with the person at work. When you allow the Holy Spirit to guide you, and then he starts taking little subtle directions in your life, and you begin to learn his voice and experience and intimacy with him, and you don't have any other way unless you're listening and looking and saying, God, do your work inside of me. See, it's all the work of the Holy Spirit inside of you. And the work of the Holy Spirit inside of you is actually called the Holy Spirit. And his job is to make us more like God. To, in, in Romans chapter 1, he's referred to as the Spirit of Holiness. Yeah? The Spirit of, the spirit of Holiness is at work in our lives. He's actually producing what? Holiness. He's actually producing what? Holiness. There you go. Yeah. yeah. I know it's, it's not a very popular term today. Holiness. Woo! Sounds so... Holy, okay. Like, I don't even know if that's possible. It's 2021. You know, God, you know what's going on around the world. Like, woo, maybe they could be holy back in the day of Jesus, but, woo. And can I tell you, holy doesn't mean perfect. Holy means set apart for God. Yeah. Set apart for God. You, you serve a holy God that's set apart, and you have been set apart for him. 
That does not mean you're going to be perfect tomorrow, but that means you are allowing the Holy Spirit to change you, to convict you, to shape you, to get the old out of you and put the new inside of you, to let him change your thinking, to change your attitudes. You know, that's just the way I am. That's the way my man was and my happy was. And that's just the way. Well, how much did you know the Holy Spirit actually wants to change you? So you don't carry that on generation to generation. Man, I'm just an Enneagram right? That's who I am. Well, how about being a sanctified Enneagram 8? And you can actually be blessed, blessed with other people. Just let the Holy Spirit do His work inside of you. And oftentimes, it's in these little, subtle ways. Now, it's the work of the Holy Spirit, but you actually have to work with the Holy Spirit. So the work of sanctification, the work of of God doing that work in you. It's the Spirit doing that work, and you've got to work with Him. Um, you've heard me say before that when you read the Bible, you're given the Holy Spirit some, something to work with, right? Um, you're doing it today. What you're doing today by showing up at church. Being here today, you are giving the Holy Spirit something to work with. As the Word of God is being prophesied and declared over your life, you're saying, okay, Holy Spirit, work with that inside me. Who is not going to make it home? TikTok is not going to make you Whatever. Not going to take you home. But there are things you can do that will actually get in step with the Spirit of God that will help you work out the work of God in your life. Like we're kicking off all these groups and classes right now. This is an opportunity for you to get into a place where the Holy Spirit has more to work with in your life so that you can make the little course corrections that you need to make. Okay, what else is there? Uh, on a journey like this, a life, you need some water, right? I could use some water right now. Hmm. Sparkling water. I didn't know the Holy Spirit was a sparkling water. Look at this verse in John 7. Jesus said this, Anyone who is thirsty may come to me. Anyone who believes in me may come and drink. For the scriptures declare, rivers of living water will flow from his heart. And when he said living water, he was speaking of the Spirit who would be given. Okay, okay, this is important. So rivers of living water, right, only come through the Holy Spirit living and reigning in your life. Some of you are wondering why your life feels so dried up. You're wondering why your spiritual life feels dried up. You're wondering why your relationships feel dried up. You're wondering why life feels dried up. You need a, the Spirit of God flowing through your life, moving through your life. It isn't in turn affected by negative situations and problems that come up because we've all got them. But you're saying, Spirit of God flows through me. That there are just not little spritz of water, but there's rivers of living water flowing through me. And when you think about it, a river isn't for the river. A river actually brings life to everybody around the river. It actually flows and gives life to other people. So when the Spirit of God is flowing through you and working in your life, it's not just about what God and the Spirit is doing in you. It's what He wants to do through you. Okay, one more thing here. It's probably the way the Holy Spirit uh, works the most frequently in my life. I am sorry to say. Uh, there are times when I am opening my mouth to say something that I think is important to say. And this is the word of the Lord to me. That's usually what I hear, followed by God, you don't need to say that. Or I will think I need to give my opinion about something that's going on in the world today. Oh, my God, you better know what I believe in. Oh, Holy Spirit, this is hard. This is cool. Why don't you talk to me about that instead of Or I want to say something to somebody that is wrong, and I want them to know that they're wrong and that I'm right. And, I'm okay. <laughs> and the Holy Spirit says, that's not necessary. Some of y'all need to go buy this today when you leave. There's something, there's something for the Holy Spirit to work with. Okay, where's it in the Bible, Todd? Here's where it is, Psalm 141. Set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips to keep me from speaking thoughtlessly. The Holy Spirit. 
Spirit will help you so that you don't speak thoughtlessly, carelessly, because your words have power, and your words can destroy a marriage, a relationship, a friendship, a business. A, a, it can destroy so much. So the Holy Spirit will actually, one version says, put a muzzle over my mouth, the Lord. Spirit of God, when I go and say something, I only want my words to be words that you would speak. So speak through me, I pray. It's the work of the Holy Spirit. There's a verse in 2 Corinthians uh, 3.17 that says, Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's what? Freedom. Freedom. Yes, the Spirit of God. All these things. I want to make sure you get this. Everything we're talking about, the map, the compass, right, the water, the tape, all of it is for freedom. It's not to restrict us. No, 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 no. The work of the Holy Spirit is not to bind you up. It's to set you free. It's to help you live the life that you have been created by God to live. Psalm 119 says, I have gained perfect freedom by following your ways, by following the Holy Spirit of God, what you say. See, God's ways are not heavy. The ways of the world are heavy. God's ways do not bind you up. The Spirit does not come to bind you up, but to give you freedom. So the world says, do what you want, with whoever you want, however you want. It's you, 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 right? That doesn't lead to freedom, honey. That leads to bondage. And it leads to a lot of regret. You just ask people to live that way. But the world says, man, it's, it's, it's one more drink, it's, just a, it's one more party, it's one more hit, it's one more pill. Free your mind. It doesn't free your mind. You have some people that have been trying to break free from that addiction. That's the ways of the world. That's not the ways of the spirit. The ways the world says, man, you can look at whatever you want to online, on your phone. It's you, you're not hurting anybody. Truth is, it's killing you. And you're in bondage to it. And God says, I don't want you in bondage. God says, I want you free. I want you living in freedom so my spirit is going to live in you and want to work in you. And so if you let the spirit of God work inside you, it's going to produce liberty and freedom and joy and peace and hope. And the only way we get that is through the Holy Spirit. In Galatians chapter 5, Paul says, it is for freedom that Christ has set me free. So don't be bound up anymore under a yoke or bondage of slavery. And then later on, he goes, so I say, the only way you'll get this is you're going to walk by the Spirit. And if you walk by the Spirit, you don't gratify the desires of the flesh. Oh, I just want that. Because that's in opposition to the desires of the Spirit. So I'm going to walk in the Spirit. And when you walk in the Spirit, and you live in the Spirit, and you're mindful of the Holy Spirit, and every day you're praying, come Holy Spirit, fill me, come Holy Spirit, fill me up, because I, I, I used up some of this light, things bumped out of me. And think about when you go to the gas station, and you fill your car up with gas, it's full, and it clips off, right? I was trying to do a little bit extra there. Fill it up. But the moment you pull off and start driving, you start using up what you've got. And eventually, if you don't fill up again, you're going to be on any on the side of the road. And some people are wondering why they feel like they on the side of the road. Because you got to every day fill up with the Holy Spirit. Every day say, come, Holy Spirit, fill me new, fill me afresh. And when you pray that prayer, He will every time. So what do we do with this message? I'm so glad you asked. What we're going to do is we're going to make sure every day that we allow the Holy Spirit to have His way in our life. Every day... We, we're not in the home. They have my home. School, I'm going to work. I, Holy Spirit, I need you. And every day I'm looking for the light. I'm looking for his light. I'm listening for his whisper, for his warning, for the directions that he wants to give. Every day I'm praying, come Holy Spirit, fill me fresh and new so that I can live the life you created me to live. But the truth is, many of you know some of this and have done some of this, yet you're still bound up. There's a lot of Christians that are have things right with the Lord, but there's just some stuff that ain't right still on the inside. And you actually need to figure out how to work out, walking out in the Spirit. This next week, we're starting something called a freedom class. And if you've never taken a freedom course at Christ Fellowship, I would, I would, as your pastor, I would ask you to take it. I would challenge you to take it. It, would, it will change your life. It will change some of the wrong thinking that you've had in your life, some of the things that have been spoken over your life, and it will allow you to be filled with the Spirit of God in a way to live your life with perfect freedom. And if you want more information about freedom, you can text freedom to 441-441. We'll get that to you, but man, you've got to take a step. 
you experience the life that only Jesus can give you through the Spirit of God. I'm going to ask you all of our campuses that you would stand with me as we pray today. And just ask that nobody leaves in this moment because I want to guide you in a few prayers to the Holy Spirit. I said earlier that so often we pray to God the Father, and so often we pray to Jesus, but we're going to take some time as we close this service to pray to the Holy Spirit and ask Him to invade every part of our life. May I remind you that the Holy Spirit is a gentleman. He will not take territory that you don't freely give Him. He won't just come in and invade a space in your life. You actually have to invite Him into that space. And so we're going to do that today. First prayer we're going to pray is really a prayer of repentance because many of us have maybe been ignoring the nudges of the Holy Spirit or the word that He's been trying to direct us in. And the first prayer is, God, I'm sorry, Holy Spirit, I'm sorry. So would you bow your hands with me as we pray? God, we thank you for your word that teaches us what is right and what is true and how to walk in it. And Holy Spirit, we are made more aware today that we are desperate for you. We need you more than the air we breathe. We need you more than the food we're going to eat later today. We need you this week. We need you in this moment. And so we start with a prayer of repentance. Forgive us for the times that we ignored your still small voice, the conviction of your spirit. We uh, did something that we know we shouldn't do. You were there right there going, no, 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 that's not for you. Come back over this way. And we just kind of did our own thing. Right where you are in the privacy of this prayer, would you just tell the Holy Spirit you're sorry? And now, would you just open your hands up in a posture of receiving? We're going to pray, uh, Come, Holy Spirit. Would you just say those words to Him? Come, Holy Spirit. Fill my life, every area of my life. I surrender to you. I ask for your power and your presence in a, in a bold way to make its way in my life, to change my life, to direct my days, and I will follow you the best I know how, Holy Spirit, every day. It's in Jesus' name we pray, and everybody said, amen, amen. Church, we love you so much. Listen, if you need prayer today for anything in all of our locations, our prayer teams are coming up. We'd love to pray with you. Maybe something we share you want to pray about. And next weekend, don't miss it. Christine Canyon is in the house.